So uh, the most interesting thing philosophically is that many philosophers, perhaps uh, a majority of philosophers, as at least analytic philosophers, see as uh, uh, supernatural or at least queer or odd entities uh, features of the world that other naturalists would consider obvious or at least uh, very natural. So famously, it was mentioned, uh, John Mackey wrote about ethical properties. If there were objective values, uh, about values and, and properties, also moral properties, if there were objective values, they, then they would be entities or qualities or relations of a very strange sort, utterly different from anything else in the universe. Now this is how it defines the universe. Something that doesn't contain any value, any normative feature. So for him, all moral theories that appeal, or value theories that appeal to, are realistic in some sense, or even not just realistic, objectivistic, they are just wrong. They are, he has an error theory about this. They are wrong, wrong theories about ethics, wrong theories about any normative field. The same does had to be filled with mathematical properties. Everyone knows that even Quine had to be a protocol of uh, a platonist, a realist about abstract entities of mathematics because of his uh, inference to the best explanation from physics. Well, Field is a more uh, consistent natural, strict naturalist and says, no, we shouldn't accept those entities, abstract entities, because we cannot causally interact with them. So how can we say that they exist? has this strict view about how we can know things in the world, and he tries to present a view of mathematics, famously, uh, of science, sorry, without numbers. One of his books is Science Without Numbers. Utterly unconvincing, but unconvincing in, the, in his own view of that you can do a science without a physics without numbers. And then the Churchland say, analogously, uh, the theories or our views, the attribute to each other, mental states, are just wrong theories. There are no so, such things. Beliefs and desires are like phlogisto, okay? They don't exist. Uh, Galen Strozon argues the same about uh, personal identity, free will, and then more, in, more interesting, or perhaps more, more uh, spectacularly, there are people who argue that macroscopic objects and properties don't exist. This is one is Ted Sider, but the other one is Wilfred Sellers, who wrote, as a philosopher, I, when I talk as a philosopher, not as a human being, but because philosophers are not, don't belong to the category, probably. So, as a philosopher, for me, this, this table doesn't exist, and David doesn't exist. He didn't mention him explicitly, but that was the point. Oh, human beings don't exist. Only the entity of microphysics can be said to exist. Um, and that was Sellers, considered, you know, one moderate figure in this world. And so, many other. Uh, how, uh, my question now is, uh, how can we have reached this point that so many important features of the human world ended up to be judged queer, so queer that they can, we cannot accept them? Uh, how can be the world now be so disenchanted, according to many people? So, I would offer a little genealogy of this. Uh, first, I want to talk about the old enchantment, the old uh, that ended in uh, the late Renaissance. Um, for, with the enchanted, enchantment of the old world, I take there, we should consider two features. One is a strong form of pluralism, ontological, causal, and epistemological. Aristotle is a good prototype, right? Aristotle says, writes in the metaphysics, being can be said in many ways. There are many forms of existence. Causal, he has famously four causes. Now in modern terms, probably we would only just, for these four causes or principles, only two would be co considered causes. Final and efficient causes, but he accepts them both. And of course, nowadays, it's much more problematic to talk about final causes in philosophy. Even if, for example, Akil was exactly talking about that, right? Uh, so the first criteria for the old, old uh, characteristic of the old enchanted world was plurali pluralism in uh, ontological, causal, and epistemological ways. There were many ways of legitimate ways of knowing. And the second part, and this is denied also, 
nowadays. People tend to say that all alleged knowledge that is not, at least in principle, reducible to the knowledge of the natural sciences is not genuine knowledge. So pluralism for the old enchantment, and then another thing, axiological hierarchies. Uh, and this comes so especially out of the idea of the great chain of being, in which the, all the existence are connected, but in a hierarchical structure. Um, let me give you an example that actually I took uh, more than 20 years ago by reading a great anthology on philosophy by John Cotting on Western philosophy. And there is a, a part of the politics by Aristotle, then after that I have studied by her, th thanks to, to John. So Aristotle offers this reason in favor of the institution of slavery. He discusses different reasons. He, offers, he accepts three reasons and refuses one. He accepts the idea that slavery is good because you know, in order to live a happy life, you need not to work with your hands, so someone else has to work for you. Second point, paternalistic explanation. Slavery is good for the slave, famously, right? Um, it's the same justification of colonialism. You know, doing that is good for them. And then he refuses the idea that it's la that was the most traditional justification of slavery. Um, you, everyone who is a prisoner of war should become a slave. He strongly disagrees with that for the same reason for which he agrees with the other reasons. He thinks that in nature there are natural hierarchies of individuals. So only people who are in the, at the bottom of this hierarchy can become slaves. And that's very interesting, especially for the way Aristotle argues for this idea that there are natural slaves, natural hierarchies in the human world. He gives a lot of examples. He says, for example, look at the family. Of course, there are the parents and the children. And of course, there are the husband and the wife, right? Clear hierarchy. And then it goes on. He says, in the animal world, there is always hierarchy in the group. And then he looks at the astronomic structure. And then another example, the musical mode. In the mu among the music, the tone, the melody, there is always a, a hierarchy between, among the, the notes, right? So in modern terms, we would say that the tonic is the most important note. So his point is, there are hierarchies everywhere. Why not in the human world? And this is a gr an in very interesting point. Aristotle cannot see a difference without making an, a hierarchy. So he makes hierarchy, the right is better than the left, the top is better than the down, the front is better than the back. Everywhere, every time there is a hierarchy, there is a distinction in value. So it's a strongly axiological world. And this goes on, of course, right? If you think of about uh, Dante, Dante in the Middle Ages had a, this very axiological world in which everyone had their own point, even in the human world. That was your position in society. Do not try to modify it, right? Uh, so this is to say that when a modern liberal naturalist wants a re-enchanted world, they are only talking about the pluralistic characteristic of features, not the hierarchical one. That's a big difference, right? Uh, but what happened was that the disenchantment went very radical. So we lost together the hierarchization of uh, things, of entities, and the pluralism. But there was a period, very interesting period, in which happily, from a philosophical point of view, people had secularization without disenchantment. So, and I'm talking about the great example is Machiavelli, who not by coincidence was loved by Spinoza and Marx, because Machiavelli could elaborate a view in which human uh, beings can f uh, for, uh, uh, <coughs> shape their own future according to their own values, especially it's not so much in the prints, but in the discourses, it makes it clear that there is one value that politically is the most important one. So a good society is one where the conflicts are institutionalized, like in the Roman Republic. That is point. So this value rules all his ideas about politics. And there are other values. The point with Machiavelli is this. It's not threatened by the providence of God. It's not really a theistic thinker. So it's not menaced by the fact that God has established everything and we cannot change anything like in the Middle Ages. There is not such a menace there. But there is not 
There is not yet the other menace that will become real in the next century, the laws of nature. The idea that everything is true is determined by the laws of nature. Machiavelli time, there was not this idea. So he says, a strange period in history uh, in which metaphysical contingency uh, has a conceptual space that neither the previous age nor the following one did, would know. It's a very interesting one. Um, what happened after that, as we know, uh, is that this idea that science is everywhere and the, the laws of science uh, are form a block of, as, as William James said, um, a block of iron of the universe. Think about Kant's third antinomy. Where is freedom in the phenomenal world? It's impossible. There cannot be such a thing. This is why Kant tries with the noumenal freedom, because in the world there cannot be real agency. This is the problem of modernity. Where do you feel fit agency if the world is structured their way? The, contingent, the possibility of contingency was lost in this scenario. And we are still there because people still nowadays take the world as Kant did. Kant was a strictly Newtonian. Of course, now people believe in, we believe in uh, quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity, but the difference is the same, the problem is the same. Where do you fit? This is called the placement problem for people who organize the world that way. There is only the world that physics this, this presents. Where can we fit agency there? Uh, let me say something about where this, uh, this passage to modernity started. There is an year, a publication that's not very famous, but I think it should be. It's 1597, and it's a fam famous among Renaissance scholars. A book by Jacopo Mazzoni, who was a, a teacher and a friend of Galileo and Padua, and he wrote about the discussion between Plato's, Platonists and Aristotelians in Padua at the end of the 1500. And there it's very important, because this is where science disconnected from common sense. He writes, it is well known that Plato believed that mathematics was quite particularly appropriate for physical investigation, which was the reason why he himself had many times recourse to it for the explanation of physical mysteries. But Aristotle had a quite different view, and he explained the errors of Plato by his Plato to great attachment, attachment to mathematics. So the idea here is, Mazzoni says this is the debate, Galileo was taking part of it, but he was still very young. Is the world, the physical world, describable and explainable by mathematics or not? Because at that point, mathematics w was only applied to astronomy, not to physics. Um, this is, uh, changes everything. Look at what Galileo wrote uh, in the dialogue. So this is 40 years after. I cannot ever sufficiently admire the outstanding acumen of those who have taken hold of heliocentrism and accepted it as true. They have, through sheer force of intellect, done such violence to their own senses as to prefer what reason told them over, over that which sensible experience plain showed them to the contrary. So, sensible experience don't testify anymore about the structure of the world. So Galileo refused uh, the reality of secondary properties, um, refused the, he gave a ontological primacy to the categories of quantity and relation over qual or the, the, qual the uh, uh, categories of quality and modality, refused final causes, uh, and then no ontological or axiological differences in the universe because it was isotropic, uh, and no space for theology, of course, in natural philosophy. Uh, people nowadays, that was very c clear a few years ago. Now the debate in the history of science is terrible. It's dominated by philologists, and they think that you know this discussion between Aristotelians and Platonists that was in Galileo's time is not very relevant. That's crazy. Let me quote a great historian of science, Alexander Coiré, that wrote in 1943. What was in question in that discussion about if the physical world is mathematical or not, is not the use of, math of mathematics in physical science. No Aristotelian has ever denied our right to measure what is measurable and to count what is numerable, but the structure of science and therefore the structure of being. So the point was if the being as such was mathematical or not. We know how it went, right? The answer was yes, the being is mathematical. The only point was that the whole being became mathematical. Uh, Three and a half centuries, almost four centuries after Galileo, actually four centuries after 
sorry, three centuries after Galileo, who still wrote great pages about this passage. This is crucial because the diagnosis of Husserl was very important, but then he went, went too far. And I think this is at the origin of contemporary incapacity of philosophy to deal with this, the relationship between the manifest image and the scientific image. Wrote, I'm almost done. Huh? Wrote uh, Husserl. Galileo performed a surreptitious substitution of the mathematically structured world of idealities, so uh, mathematical idealities, for the only real world, which is actually given through perception, which is ever experienced expi and experienceable, our everyday life world. Uh, and this substitution was promptly passed on to his successors, the physicists and philosophers, I would add, of all succeeding centuries. So that's the point. For uh, Husserl, and I think liberal naturalists agree with that, the, an expansive naturalist, I think, also, the life world, the world of human experience, is real, contrary to what strict naturalists say. It's real, it's not reducible in its totality to the categories of the natural sciences. However, Husserl also writes that the world of human experience is the only real world. And it becomes another strange form of monist. Uh, so on the one side, he correctly says that moral values and meanings can be real, secondary qualities do really belong to the external object in which would commonsensically look at them. And he correctly says that the life world, he says, is the forgotten meaning fundamental of natural science. So it's genealogical, a conceptual fundament. That's what Sellers would also repeat. Um, I agree with that, we agree with that, but then he adds that scientific concepts, this is also, are merely idealizations with practical purposes, but do not refer to any unobservable reality, because the only world, the only real world, is the world of the manifest image. So there is no scientific world. So look at the situation nowadays. Continental philosophers tend to only care about the manifest image. I don't care, think about Heidegger writing that, science doesn't think. Don't give any credit to the scientific description of the world and explanations from science with, with terrible results. We know that people think that, you know, science is cheating us on, on the utility of the vaccines or these things. On the other side, the scientific uh, naturalists, they say only science describes the world. So my point is we should look for a, uh, a form of secularization that doesn't descend in disenchanted, disenchant the world. Uh, so it's a pl pluralistic, but not, of course, without the old axiological hierarchy. Uh, and that reconciling the two views, reconciling the idea that both the manifest image and the scientific image are legitimate, indispensable, and mutually irreducible. So it's a form of secularizing enchantment that accepts pluralism in ontology, epistemology, causality, and is democratic about values and, and uh, norms. There, is, there are not the old Aristotelian differentiations among uh, entities, especially human beings. This is, I think, what is worth fighting for. Thank you very much.